Okay, hi everybody, happy Friday. Uh, my name is Megan Dean. I am an assistant professor in philosophy at Michigan State University in the States. Um, and I would like to welcome you to this uh, meeting of the 2022 spring session of Half-Baked Online Colloquia series. The series is part of the activities of Culinary Mind, which is a leading international center promoting philosophical thinking on food. Um, and the series is organized by Andrea Borghini, Beatrice Serini, and Nicola Paras, and myself. Um, and the series aims to highlight new work on philosophical issues that pertain to food and eating practices, to spark discussion and debate, and to connect scholars working in this area. Um, if you want to see some videos of our past events, you can visit our webpage in the media section. And if you would like to stay up to date on the news um, with Culinary Mind, you can subscribe to our mailing list, which is on the webpage and the other contact information there as well. Um, now it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you um, Danya Glabo. Um, Glabo is a medical anthropologist and STS scholar and the uh, industry, industry assistant professor and director of the science and technology studies program at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, her research examines patient activism, the medical economy, and how human bodies become valuable data. Her forthcoming book, which is called Food Allergy Advocacy, Parenting and the Politics of Care, examines how food allergy activists get involved in scientific research and political advocacy, and how race, class, and gender shape their advocacy goals. And she earned her PhD from the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. And today she is here to speak to us about food allergies and the hygienic sublime. So please join me in welcoming Don. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and again, it's really uh, exciting to see both new and familiar names uh, in the uh, in the little boxes this morning. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen uh, to get started. Great. And I believe everyone should be able to see it now. Yes. Great. Um, all right, um, so I want to talk uh, about a piece of the work that went into my book today, Food Allergies and the Hygienic Sublime. Some of you might recognize the title. Um, there was a previously published paper um, on this topic, um, but I, I want to kind of expand on it in a couple of ways um, today in my talk and then in our conversation. So number one, I'll be um, kind of resituating um, the um, again, the analysis, the paper you might have already seen um, in the larger argument of the book about the reproductive politics of food allergy advocacy. Um, and number two, um, I have uh, a bunch of the images that I was thinking with uh, while writing this chapter, which unfortunately uh, for permissions and uh, trying to finish the book before the baby was born reasons uh, are not in the book. Um, so you can get a little bit of a, a you know, some of the extras that didn't make it into the book. Um, I will say the images are not great quality. Uh, baby was sick this week, so I did not have a chance to go make uh, better copies. So we're working from some photos that I took uh, when I was originally doing the research, but uh, you'll still be able to get the idea. I'm so really excited to be here today. Um, so um, in life with food allergies, purity is paramount. The ordinary markers of a lived in home or kitchen, crumbs on the counter, a thin sheen of oil on the stovetop, a dusting of flour on the shelves, present immediate dangers to someone managing an allergy to peanuts, wheat, or shellfish. To manage such ever-present threats, food allergy households turn to intensive management of home hygiene including management of food sourcing, preparation surfaces, utensils, and other aspects of the domestic space. The tidy, desirable home is modeled in media images as well of sparkling clean high-end kitchens and scenes of heteronormative bliss. And this image is one of my favorite uh, of the genre. You've got the Eames chairs, the mid-century uh, modern uh, credenza in the background, you know, the mom's wearing white to care for a baby, right? So the even concrete floors is like very of the moment in 2014 uh, when this image came from. Uh, and I'll talk about this and, and some of these other images more uh, in, a, in a moment. But I call these figurations of perfect hygiene, the hygienic sublime. The hygienic sublime prompt the confrontation with the limits of purity in the face of microscopic agents like food oils and proteins. At the same time, the hygienic sublime contributes to the reproduction of whiteness, heteronormativity, 
wealth, and nuclear families as the means through which bodily safety can be assured in the contaminated and contaminating spaces of modern life. Um, so I'm going to zoom out to the book uh, and say a little bit about the argument, the research, um, and kind of how this fits in. And then we'll get uh, more into uh, some of the arguments and uh, case studies, interviews of this particular uh, piece of it. Um, so this book argues that the multifaceted story of care and responsibility concerning uh, uh, food allergy is an emblematic story about the reproductive politics of health advocacy in the contemporary United States. Food allergic living throws into relief the cultural expectations about individual and family responsibility as opposed to societal responsibility for sick and disabled people, particularly children, as well as the gendering of care work in the home. These expectations are inflected by the ways that race, gender, and class have been entwined with public health, child rearing, food preparation, and hygiene. The safety measures taken in the private space of the home shape food allergy advocacy efforts in public uh, and inform the politics of science and technology that shape the treatment of the condition. Food allergy advocacy then is a stage for reproducing the culturally dominant, that is white, middle class, and heteronormative politics of personhood and responsibility in the contemporary US. Um, and I wanted to just say a little bit about this analytic of reproductive politics. Um, at various points throughout the talk, I'll, I'll be talking about some of um, the reproductive, um, uh, talking about reproductive work in various ways. Um, and um, you know, this is a term that's been kind of used in, in a lot of ways. Um, and I kind of think about it in two ways that I see as very connected, right? First, um, I sometimes use it to reference immediate biological concerns um, that are often voiced in urgent terms by food allergy parents, especially mothers, keeping food allergic children healthy and alive so they can grow to adulthood, right? At the really basic level, that's um, what this is all about. Right, but as humans, we rely on each other to ensure collective well being. Um, and so, biological reproduction is necessary for social reproduction as well, right? Which is the, the second, or as I kind of put it here, the more sociological sense um, that's been mobilized um, by, um, especially by US and Italian uh, feminists, um, Marxist feminists, and Black feminists. Um, so, referring to the maintenance of relations of domination along the axes of race, class, and gender. Um, food allergy advocacy and immunological science, two different things I did at various points in the book, um, both work to reproduce patriarchal gender relations, for example, by positioning mothers as the ideal caretakers of children. Um, in practice, again, I don't think these two senses of the term reproduction are easily separated, so I've offered this kind of ambitious analytical book reproductive politics. Um, and so this was based on um, about two and a half years of ethnographic field work. Um, so that included interview with parents of food allergic children, food allergic adults, um, industry entrepreneurs, like people who started small uh, companies making allergen free foods, as well as allergists and other clinicians. Um, I shadowed physicians in two different allergy clinics for a little over six months total, several times a week. Um, I attended advocate organized and advocacy focused events throughout the United States uh, over the course of about a year and a half. Um, and I also attended a medical allergy conference. Um, You'll also see um, there was kind of always in the background a certain amount of media and social media analysis going on, especially 2014 to 2016. And then I picked up um, some more threads of the media coverage of food allergy in 2020. Um, most of the 2020 stuff, um, or all of the 2020 stuff is a different section from what we'll talk about today. Um, but this includes looking at allergy product advertising, uh, advocacy organization messaging, food allergy memoirs and popular science books. Um, there are actually a number of memoirs, some of them quite, quite nicely written. Um, food allergy children's books, which was, uh, there was kind of a boom in those when I was doing the main part of this research in 2015, 2016, um, and also following key activist social media accounts. 
Um, and uh, just to give you an idea kind of how this fits into the larger book. Um, so this is kind of what the plan of the book looks like and, and kind of generally the way the book plots this out is, oh, did someone need to jump in? I hear someone, oh, that might've been an accident, okay. Um, generally the way the book um, works is it kind of starts at the individual and, and family context. Uh, so the moral life of epinephrine talks about what people uh, do to kind of adjust and learn when they first uh, are diagnosed with a food allergy, how parents are enlisted as caretakers. Uh, the second chapter, who is to blame, looks a little bit more closely at the medical science around food allergies, what it means for mothers in particular. Hygienic Sublime is kind of this pivot point between those kind of individual and family concerns and some of the wider concerns um, that lead people into advocacy, which is what the last two chapters are really focused on. Activist politics and the EpiPen pricing scandal and the future of food allergy advocacy. So how, do, um, how does what happens in the home inform people's um, priorities, desires, and goals uh, in the public advocacy realm? Um, and uh, again, one of the really important sets of characters, important set of characters in this story um, through the book are uh, especially food allergy mothers or food allergy moms, as they sometimes call themselves, um, who, as I'll say uh, a little bit more about coming up, uh, often kind of reflexively take on the job of uh, caring for food allergic children when there's a new diagnosis in the household, um, kind of in the moment of crisis. Uh, the typical gendered roles become a resource for managing um, uh, for managing a difficult situation. Right. And again, this is what we're talking about today. Um, and I just wanted to add a little bit of context for those of you who are not from the US. Um, so here I'm quoting quoting myself from social media. Um, but you know, I'm sure if you know people in the US, you've heard about how terrible it is to be a parent here, and it's unfortunately all true, right? So um, you know, thinking about the hygienic sublime and the role of mothers, um, you know, there's there's kind of the baseline expectations around um, gender and, and kind of normative gender roles in the home. Um, but there's also just an incredible degree of uh, financial pressure as well that it's, I, I think, pretty unique uh, to the US uh, these days, right? So here, kind of riffing on that, you know, the idea that you're supposed to be solely responsible for your kids as a parent or a nuclear family, but school ends at 3 p.m., daycare is $2,000 or more per month per child, but then you also have to keep your job to pay for health insurance, um, but also you have to pay for health insurance. Median income is $67,000. You get $3,000 uh, per month, maybe after taxes and benefits, out of which comes that $2,000 per kid for daycare. Um, plus, speaking for myself, at least our rent is $2,600 for a tiny apartment. Uh, so it, it kind of doesn't add up. And I think that's part of, it's an important part of the context for understanding the kind of uh, intense emotional content um, of the hygienic sublime and of caring for food allergy children um, in general. Okay. So food, food allergic people and caretakers of allergic children face constant challenges when trying to control the movement of food oils, proteins, and other chemicals, which are often present in such small amounts as to be invisible. The pursuit of purity in food allergic living is an attempt, I argue, to domesticate the dangers of food substances through scrubbing, washing, wiping, separating, storing, packing, and transporting foods and the objects they contact in ways that maintain and create purity. Hearing repeated stories about the impossibility of purity, about failures, mix-ups, anxieties, and resulting illness was the seed for this chapter. The sublime at play in food allergic living is not the pastoral or beautiful sublime uh, in the grander than the human scale sense of Edmund Burke's typification of the beautiful and the sublime. It's instead about dangers at the microscopic scale. In everyday practice, controlling tiny environmental contaminants perfectly and consistently through household hygiene is impossible. Um, and these failures serve to remind individuals, often in traumatic ways, about the limited capacity of human control over things that are much smaller than the human scale. Right? So again, the sublime tends to be about the big, here we're talking about it as the small. 
Um, so the um, so the the difference between the hygienic sublime and and the kind of established sublime tradition again lies in the direction of difference in magnitude between humans and their threatening enticing environs, um, as well as a shift in the gendering of the particular activities performed in response to the stimulus of sublimity. Um, so this is something that environmental humanities scholars have written about um, rather extensively. That the sublime is not just an aesthetic, but it's also um, kind of instilling an affective state, right? An orientation to uh, action, right? An action which um, typically has been very gendered, right? So in the call to perform housework um, in the hygienic sublime um, is, is the kind of never ending task that's demanded. The action must go on in kind of uh, at any scale of the sublime, despite the feeling that the non-human scale overwhelms the best of human intentions. As literary scholar Robert Miles argues, sublime imagery and experiences of the sublime in United States contexts typically inspired or were intended to inspire normative masculine feats of endurance and strength recorded in the, in the diaries and publication of historical colonizers, soldiers, and explorers. Embodying masculinity on the frontier was linked with an enactment of Americanness, motivating generations of soldiers, politicians, and enterprising young men to expand the nation's territory. Masculinity was the proper response to sublime landscapes and masculine feats of conquest and settlement exemplified an American vision of national progress. This form of progress was expansionist and concerned with the control of land in the 19th century, and it shifted, as historian David Nye argues, to emphasize the pursuit of technological advancements in the 20th. So again, rather than emboldening wilderness adventures, the hygienic sublime portrayed in food allergy publications uh, like Allergic Living Magazine targets homemakers, implicitly women, and entices them to make home improvements and invest in organizing systems, cooking tools, air filters, and allergy-friendly interior paint. It mediates, in other words, a turn inward, an intensification of the regard paid toward private domestic spaces and the families that inhabit them. The hygienic sublime is clearly classed as well. Poor people need not attempt it as the goods, time, and expertise require generously available time and capital. So in the media version of the hygienic sublime, slim white women smile and take care of children, like you see here. Uh, they shine together via typically in pure, properly filtered sunlight. In real life, however, women quit their jobs to cook, clean, and purify full time to protect against the dangers posed to their children by microscopic agents in food. Um, so again, I just wanted to kind of go through a few of the images that I was thinking with um, putting together this, um, this part of the project. Um, and so these are images from uh, 2014 uh, issues of Allergic Living Magazine, uh, which is one of um, two or three magazines ta uh, targeted at the food allergy, gluten intolerance um, communities. Um, you know, I will say, uh, you know, these images and the critique here is drawn from this like 2014, 2015 period that was the main part of my research. Um, the editor of Allergic Living Magazine, Gwen Smith, is very smart um, and I think would probably sympathize with some of these critiques. Uh, if you look at more recent issues, you know, the some of the imagery around families and race in particular has really shifted and become more inclusive, right? So I just want to flag that you know, this is one of the challenges of ethnography. Um, it's contemporary, but it also captures, you know, a, a particular kind of moment. And, and that's where um, the, um, uh, that's where uh, my kind of comments on the media are really rooted is in this particular moment. Um, but so this image here, right, the, the better nursery, right, this is uh, one kind of typical kind of article you would find in this magazine right how to design or rent or buy products for your home um, that makes it better cleaner uh, safer for people with allergies um, and so these features tended to be inclusive of food allergies as well as environmental allergies um, and again here you see a kind of mother and baby in the kind of filtered light that's very 
Hispanic looking, uh, mostly white uh, bedroom, mother wearing white, baby is, is clean and naked. Um, so, um, you know, this is a, a kind of trope that you see uh, in a lot of these ads. My favorite here, uh, right? Um, so, you know, this kind of, you know, if you buy $3,000 leather chairs, then your home is clean enough uh, for the allergic family member, right? It's, it's kind of the, the subtext here, maybe the text here. Um, and um, uh, and the caption here is promoting a book as a building material as well. Um, there's also a, a whole uh, genre of ads, um, and these are pretty much unchanged. Like these look the same now as they 2014 and 2015. Um, there's a whole kind of genre of ads for specialty foods uh, that are free, typically free from nuts, um, dairy, sometimes wheat. Um, so on the right, you see wow butter, which is a sunflower seed substitute for peanut butter. Uh, on the left, you see Rudy's, which is a gluten-free uh, baking company. They make all kinds of products uh, beyond bread. I think this one's for those are some kind of nuggets of oh, ciabatta rolls, um, but they make all kinds of you know, like, you know, kid friendly foods now as well. And, and that they're widely available in the United States. Um, so again, lots of scenes of, you know, mom cooking, uh, kids helping out, clean white kitchens, everything in its place. Uh, the wow butter one also really gets me as well because there's there's this kind of infantilizing aspect to it where mom is being fed by dad, um, and uh, which always kind of uh, seemed kind of odd to me. Um, another type of feature um, is the kitchen renovation feature. Um, so kitchens that cook I, I, is one that's always kind of stuck in my head. Um, so this is one place where um, you really see uh, kind of luxury materials and, and luxury uh, building techniques being promoted as uh, the kind of key to healthfulness. Um, so using, uh, uh, you see on the right, choose cabinets that aren't filled with formaldehyde, right, which basically means having a carpenter come in and build custom cabinets from hardwood in your house, uh, which in the United States is definitely not the cheapest way to install cabinets. It's much cheaper and easier to go to Home Depot uh, or Ikea. Um, on the left, right, you can see the hardwood floors, hardwood cabinets. Um, I don't know if that's granite or um, marble countertop, right? But uh, clean materials, um, stainless steel um, appliances. Um, again, the, the implication here is that um, investing in these high-end materials um, is a way to basically buy yourself health. Um, lots of ads also for hardwood floors. Um, so the idea there is um, getting rid of the opportunity to trap dust in a carpet, which can improve allergies and asthma. Um, again, um, not the not necessarily the cheapest option, um, but being posited as a solution um, to what can be a real problem for sure. Um, and these uh, this series of ads uh, really grabbed me. Um, because it has almost these kind of religious overtones, right? You have the woman kind of looking up into the light. Um, you um, uh, uh, and um, you can kind of see the pollutants in the one on the left as well, right? So there's kind of evidence of the danger that needs to be addressed um, through this product, um, even though that's kind of not something that people would be kind of thinking about or noticing um, in their daily life. All right, um, so that's our little digression into um, what the food allergy sublime looks like. So according to Ruth Schwartz Cowan, US ideas about women's work are highly historically contingent and much more recent than many would imagine. She argues, for example, that the work that colonial American women did to complete the first steps of cooking that might today be re recognized as domestic, hauling water, tending fires, cooking in heavy iron pots, did not encode the same concerns about the delicacy of the female body than it would later on. Um, she argues that it was in fact the development of more convenient household products and tools, starting with mass produced milled flowers, that supported the entrenchment of strongly gendered division of labor in the typical American home. 
By World War I, housework, including most food preparation, was thought of no longer as a chore, but rather as an expression of the housewife's personality and her affection for her family. Feeding the family had once just been part of the day's work. Now it was a way to communicate deep-seated emotions. The housewife's was a necessary role within the heterosexual family, but a tightly circumscribed one. Conversely, when things went wrong, she was entirely to blame since remedies for those conditions were easy at hand and easy to apply. So I wanna argue here that the food preparation techniques used to manage food allergies in the home continue this deeply gendered ordering of the work of social re reproduction in and through the American home. The stakes of su success are particularly high for food allergy parents because they can be the difference between health and illness, even life and death. Um, so I want to talk um, just a little bit about a couple of the interviews here um, and then uh, kind of wrap up with some final comments. So one woman's story in particular illustrates to me the stakes of purity. Um, and so this is someone that I call Alice. Um, I met Alice over dinner at a conference for food allergy media professionals in 2014 in the United States. Uh, her children were attending college at that time and starting new jobs. Um, but she told me about when her oldest son was first diagnosed with food allergies in 1991. The condition did not have the same level of visibility and community support that it does today. He was often the first child with food allergies whom his doctors, teachers, coaches, and other parents had encountered. Alice was a white woman married to a high earning man at the time, and she gave up waged work to be in charge of ensuring her son's safety at home, at school, and at play. The chance to focus on food allergy management was presented to me by Alice as a simply logical choice. Yet her narration made clear that the hygienic sublime shaped the texture of her social world and became even a benchmark of her own self-worth, right? How well she could safeguard her children through um, this pursuit of hygiene reflected on her as a person. Um, let's see skip a little bit of this um, just in the interest of time. Um, so her son was allergic to a number of things um, and food allergy labeling wasn't very sophisticated in the US yet in the 1990s. Um, so it was hard to know whether uh, different foods were safe. So to manage this uncertainty, she removed from her cabinet any packaged foods that might contain his allergens and committed herself to cooking all of his meals from scratch at home. And the issue of cross-contamination came up repeatedly in our conversation. Um, she explained that in the 1990s, there were a lot of things that today are sort of common knowledge in the food allergy world that we were just figuring out, such as the idea or the concept of cross-contamination. We couldn't figure out why the kid keep, kept reacting to things. I think, but that product doesn't have milk in it. It didn't occur to me that he could react to what was on the knife or what was on the equipment in the manufacturing plant. It didn't occur to me because there were no resources and there was no common knowledge. Uh, so Alice was one of the kind of early parents who became an early activist uh, at the local level and uh, began reaching out to other local groups. So she was you know, one of the early um, uh, you know, food allergy advocates um, and uh, you know, almost you know, 25 years later was still involved uh, in this work and community. So despite her vigilance, near mishaps and uh, misses or near misses and mishaps sometimes occurred, especially when other mothers tried to help take care of her son, right? So when she tried to expand that circle of responsible adults, um, it often felt like it backfired. So for example, one day when her son was still a toddler, she left him with a friend who she had trained to recognize and treat the symptoms of allergic reactions, um, you know, recognizing the hives and wheezing administering an, uh, an epinephrine auto injector or an EpiPen. But after some time, her friend called her and explained that he was breaking out in hives on his face. Alice rushed over thinking it was potentially a serious reaction and discovered that the friend had wiped his face with the same washcloth she had used for her own son. In effect, she had wiped allergens all over his face, as she put it. The hive spread onto his legs, suggesting that the high chair he was seated in was also coated in food residue. She summed up stories like these by lamenting that even if you find another mom who's willing to take him on and you sent the food and you've gone through the emergency procedures, the little details like that wouldn't occur to the average person. 
Um, another interview, a phone interview I conducted in 2014 with a food allergic adult named Michael offers a different view of uh, the gendering of the hygienic sublime. Michael was one of only two men that I interviewed. Um, there were very few men in the food allergy advocacy community. They tended to take on kind of expert roles. Um, uh, one person in particular was a, a mediator between, or placed himself really as a mediator between physicians and researchers and the kind of broader food allergy public, for example. Um, and uh, so Michael was only, uh, one of two men I interviewed who are primarily responsible for managing food allergy in the home and the only uh, person, uh, the only family uh, where a man was a primary caretaker for a food allergic child. In contrast to Alice, this did not feel like a choice to him. Being a full-time caregiver was not a responsibility he had ever remotely considered taking on. He initially took on this role because he developed his own food and environmental allergies, which rendered him unable to work. Although he insisted that being a stay-at-home dad had its rewards, he was devastated by the inability to have what he considered a gender-appropriate social and professional life, to be regularly active outside the home, and to bring in a significant, if not a majority, share of his household's income. He was much more willing than the women I spoke to to talk about the sense of mourning he felt in response to this life change. As we spoke by phone, he took his kitchen and told me what he saw. His version of the hygienic time was very different from that of the mothers I spoke to, in part due to the particular needs of his body. Um, yet the kind of purity that he created um, was, um, I'm sorry, even though his kitchen didn't look sublimely pure, um, the purity uh, depicted in images like those I went through a few months ago um, was still his reference point for comparing what he observed. His kitchen worked for him, but he knew that it fell short of what others would expect. For example, boxes of onions, potatoes, and butternut squash from local farmers and his own garden sat on the floor shedding soil, banishing any hope of a perfectly clean kitchen. There were, quote, a few crock pots here and there, and an extra freezer where he stored servings of bulk meals for days when he felt too ill to cook. Modern conveniences like prepared foods uh, and high-tech materials were gone, replaced by stainless steel and boxes of basic raw vegetable. It was, in his words, no frills. Um, but it was pure in the right way to ensure his health and safety. His allergens were meticulously excluded, even though that meant that dirt was introduced. Nonetheless, his reference point for appropriate hygiene was that perfect vision commonly encountered in media portrayals. And by that metric, he knew he was failing not only as a man, but also as a housekeeper. Um, and so the third um, vignette for my field work, um, the third and final one. A third parent story adds another crucial perspective to understanding the hygienic sublime, how the gender politics of the hygienic sublime intersect with race. Um, and I use the word intersect intentionally to index the black feminist concept of intersectionality, uh, especially drawing on Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins's formulations, and thereby drawing attention to the interlocking systems of power and structural exclusion at stake in the hygienic sublime. Uh, the concerns built into media expressions of the hygienic sublime typically default to a white middle class perspective on how to live and eat well with food allergies. There's an emphasis on pure, bland, sweet, starchy foods with no history, bought at a premium price, um, which are often promoted as broadly appealing solutions. Sh strategies to adapt, to adapt culturally specific and regional delicacies were at the time of my research prioritized by a small number of people. Um, one example is the Nut Free Walk blog, which is still going today, which was um, already uh, a kind of hub for uh, Asian and Asian American uh, allergy friendly cooking. Um, so it's prioritized by a small number of people, though, uh, for whom these were everyday concerns. Um, if anyone wants to talk about it later, we can talk about the different responses to contaminated cinnamon and contaminated cumin. Uh, and the Q&A is another thing that didn't make it in here. Um, but I think it's really instructive on thinking about uh, race, ethnicity, um, and food here. Um, but the vignette I do want to talk about is about uh, a woman that I'll call Andrea. 
She was a mother of a food allergic child and a leader of what she described as the only food allergy support group in the United States, specifically addressing racial, ethnic, gender, and economic diversity and inclusion. She was the only Black person I interviewed during my research and one of two Black people, both women whom I corresponded with. The other, fortunately, could not coordinate an interview. Uh, in, our in our interview, she chose to focus the discussion on issues of racial and eth ethnic diversity in food allergy support communities. Um, and she was the first, although not the last, person I spoke to who wanted to talk about that aspect of food allergy experience. Andrea started a support group in the southeastern. So, so again, this uh, the person I'm talking about is not the same as the Mount Free Walk person, um, but um, kind of uh, some similar concerns, all the different ways to address them. Andrea started a support group in the southeastern United States to create a venue where both the direct health effects of food allergy and issues of ethnicity and racism related to food and health could be openly discussed. With food allergies, she, she saw a need for speaking more openly about the variety of racial and cultural attitudes that could shape the management of the condition. In public, as she explained, people of color with food allergies did not only have to work against stereotypes like the idea that, quote, Black people don't get food allergies, which many grandparents told many parents of food allergic children, um, but also how to navigate, uh, how to change cultural norms around food and eating in social settings where they were already seen as, quote, a newcomer and an outsider. She could anticipate some of the issues that might arise for Black, Indian, or Jewish families in her southern U.S. city, for example. A wheat allergy would affect an Indian family's dietary changes differently than a Jewish family. And she kind of talked me through this um, based on conversations she had had with support group members. Different workplace or public accommodations might be appropriate for individuals from those backgrounds as well, right? Accommodations for food might put together with religious accommodations, for example, uh, in different ways than they might for someone um, kind of from white, uh, dominant white Christian um, communities. Um, but requests for legally required accommodations for a con condition that was uh, considered strange by some food allergies were more readily interpreted as rocking the boat, as she put it, coming from a racialized outsider. Her work thus focused on helping families and individuals navigate their needs for accommodations by presenting their requests in ways that would neither unduly challenge the social norms nor exacerbate suspicions about the aggressiveness of racialized people. So a couple of comments to wrap up here and then we can uh, take our quick break and move to Q&A. So the Hygienic Sublime fuses necessary requirements for purity and safety with gender, race, and class inflected aspirations of appropriate social relationships. Maintaining a certain degree of purity is a concern for people living with food allergies for good reason. An unexpected encounter with allergens can trigger an allergic reaction, and in some cases that can cause serious bodily harm. But it is a leap to move from observing that a certain kind of purity is needed to keep food allergic people healthy to the current reality where women are almost exclusively the primary caretakers of allergic children, where wealth is portrayed as a prerequisite for adequately safeguarding the home, and where white nuclear families are portrayed as the ideal support system for managing the condition. Biological needs must be filtered through strong cultural sieves in order to land on this sorting of domestic expectations and responsibilities. And so I, I kind of am thinking about purity and politics in conversation with uh, a number of, of um, now somewhat recent uh, works in feminist SPS and particularly these two books, Alexa Shotwell's book, Against Purity and Donna Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble. Um, so just to kind of wrap up here on what um, the stakes of purity are uh, for the politics of food allergy. Um, so I think the stakes of purity and the hygienic sublime, again, this enactment of purity in the home, ultimately raises some broader political questions that need to be grappled with by eaters, activists, and food scholars. For example, the pursuit of purity in private spaces um, in a practical sense within food allergy advocacy um, often kind of draws resources and attention away from addressing, for example, 
the lack of preventive regulatory enforcement concerning food safety, like allergen labeling and contamination, right? So food safety in the US is organized around the exclusion of pathogens, not around the kind of uh, cleaning and supply chain management that would be needed to um, exclude uh, allergens, all right? So you can rinse off an assembly line after you make something with peanut butter. As long as there's bleach in it and the bacteria is dead, it's good. That does nothing to get rid of the, you know, peanut on the surface of the machine, right? So there are two very different um, types of material kind of regimes or material, uh, yeah, management regimes. Um, and the bacteriological is emphasized and, and really not the allergen. Um, but the kind of focus on, on purity in the home, right, kind of distracts from issues like that, um, takes up parents and activists' time that might be spent understanding the historical and contemporary political interests that have shaped that, uh, those particular preferences for regulation. Um, and it also occupies attention that could be spent understanding the problems produced by the long and complex multinational supply chains that deliver food to the tables of US households. Um, instead, the, uh, the Hygienic Sublime offers a solution to food allergy management that demands the responsibilization of individuals and nuclear families to each tackle the problem of impure food on their own. And it parasitically relies on normative ideas about gender, race, class, and the ideal family composition it posits the politics of white wealthy heteronormativity as a safe space for allergic bodies. In food allergy advocacy, as other parts of the book then go on to chart, this narrowing of vision extends beyond the home into activists' legislative, regulatory, and legal interventions. What at home, what happens in the home is ultimately contiguous with what happens in food allergy advocacy on the public stage, right? This, I, this is a piece of feminist scholarship, right? So I'm, I am arguing that the personal is also the political. And whether this is good or bad depends on how closely one's family and home adheres to the historical ideal of domestic life. And that is the end from me for the moment. Thank you all so much.